I've got part of the camp set up, as oh, you can wow. see. Um, but what's your first impressions of America so far? Well, America is crazy. It's, it's much bigger than I expected. And really, come from UK, the island, uh, it's a lot smaller uh, than the USA. And even just being in a, in a state and not experiencing the whole of the USA. You've already seen the old England, so um, I'm going to like to introduce you to a little bit of the new one. But first, we've got to get setting up camp. So would you like to give me a hand? Sure. Let's Fantastic. go. Fantastic. Um, we've got the lean-to up here, and we wanted to extend the shelter a bit. So we had a bench um, ready for us to use, and we got a tarp right here, and we decided to set the tarp up using some power cord going right down and using the bench um, as one of our uh, points to strap the tarp down. Um, one of the big things around here that we don't really have to um, the extent that they have in the USA are mosquitoes and many other bugs flying little insects so we have a selection of useful tools that will help us to um, to repel these insects and prevent bites we've got this candle that uh, repels mosquitoes and other flying insects we've got some spray wipes and all that good stuff um, so that we don't get bitten how are you doing Alec what are you doing here doing pretty good so here I'm going to be setting up my fishing rod and we've got lots of fish here in Vermont, so I'm super excited. Uh, I've got trout, we've got a lot of smallmouth bass in the lake, and all sorts of cool stuff. So I'm just going to be lining this up now, and then we will be on our way. That concludes it for our little tour of the shelter, and we'll see you at the lake. Jolly good. Luther and I are out here collecting um, a fire starter. So, if you look here, this is a tree it's called a balsam fir, and these guys are cool because they have these little pimples. So we're just popping the little bubbles and putting it on the stick here. But yeah, it's a cool little way to get your fire going. We have a super toasty warm uh, fire going on right here. The grill has had time to heat up and we have some tin foil to make sure the, the food cooks really well. Uh, so Alec and I are the chefs today. Uh, I am going to be showing you my vegan option and Alec will show his food option. Um, right here I have some tofu which is a food made of soybeans and um, tofu is a super super good camping food I I think and um I apologize that's just gonna due lie. to technical difficulties I'm going to be introducing my food <laughs> because I am an omnivore I'll be having sausages back to the tofu <laughs> <laughs> tofu is a brilliant camping food uh, especially for vegans obviously um, because it is kind of the substitute for many other foods such as chicken um, that people would like to put in their sandwiches um, on camping trips. Uh, but today we are cooking the tofu, you can have it raw. Um, so I've got slices here, right here, and I will pop them on the nice hot campfire. So for my chopping contraption I have this awesome little um, Alaskan knife on this board and I've got the chunk of extra firm tofu and that allows me to cut it beautifully like that, get a perfect slice, and cook right through. So you said extra firm tofu. How do you de um, determine the firmness of your tofu? Oh uh, well, tofu I guess is is created by um, or made with soybeans, and um, soy can just be compacted to be more dense, less dense. I just it just depends on um, what you like really. Um, but this is pretty firm, probably just just less dense than chicken, maybe. Well, I'm going to uh, take out my food of choice now. And just pop it on the fire. Good to go. Don't want it to touch that. 
for his sake, not mine. I don't mind tofu. And for sides, we have some sweet corn. And that is um, a snack for both the vegan and the non-vegan. Put it over here for now. Uh, I don't know how much of a scent tofu has, but all the other food that we're eating does have quite a scent, so we don't want to attract any bears. We're going to make sure to clean up so that we don't get awoken by Winnie the Pooh in the middle of the night. We've got the black bears around here. Uh, what type of animals yeah. do you guys have to watch out for over in the UK? Ah, ah the smoke is super, super... Ah, ugh. Right, so the animals in the UK, we really don't have to worry about them too much. Most of them are you know herbivores um, we have deer um, lots of rodents walk about um, so most of them really aren't interested in the smell of meats and all that sort of stuff that you might cook around a campfire um, but obviously you'll get the badgers coming out that want to have a nibble at your food you'll get maybe the, the rabbits coming to steal your carrots but really we don't really have to worry about anything dangerous like black bears that we might encounter out here in the woods in the USA. I think I need to flip these over. They've had a good while on one side. Oh, Whew. I will rotate myself. <laughs> um, but once these are done, I hope to make some scrumptious, a scrumptious meal, and Alec is going to make some scrumptious dinner for himself too. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias, todos personas. So we are sitting out here on this beautiful morning. We have finally got some clear skies. So we figured, what better time than to go for a run? Now, Luther and I are both avid runners. Um, I run cross country, and I'm also in rugby, so it really helps to keep me in shape. I like to run three miles like every other day during the school week and sometimes on the weekends. And uh, during the cross country season, we obviously get a lot of runs in for morning practice, and then um, during the actual period in school, we'll run anywhere from two to four miles each morning. So it really helps to get you in shape, and it's really a fun thing to do once you start getting in shape. It's enjoyable, and it just helps to relieve stress. Yeah, so my running experience I run every weekend. Uh, between four to six miles, um, depending on how I feel. Um, and I've been running with my dad and my dogs in Cornwall for a good maybe five years, um, every single weekend. So I, I definitely enjoy running, and it's a big part of my life. Um, and yeah, it keeps me fit for my boxing training, as I'm a boxer. I box during the week, and then I run during the weekends. Um, so running here in the USA should be super, super fun, off-road and in the forests. And Luther and I have got our freedom. Um, Luther was kind enough to give me a pair, which is awesome. So I guess it's time to head off and go for a run. So let's go.
guys. So um, for me, I can't have an adventure without some fishing. So I'm going to uh, be collecting some worms today so Luther and I can try our luck in this pond over here. So I've got a uh, half of a bottle and I'm just filling it up with dirt. And I've been rummaging around these leaves but I can't seem to find any worms directly under the leaves. So I'm gonna try and flip a rock and see if we can't find something. So we'll just run over here real quick. And we're just gonna pop over this rock and see if there aren't some worms under it. <laughs> oh, there's one. Perfect little size. Um, but that pretty much covers it for this rock. But we're about to go on a hike, so we're gonna see if we can't find some other stuff. So Luther and I have been hiking through this little trail for about five minutes now. And the worm tally is still at one, but uh, that won't get our hopes down and we could hear some either some wind or some water coming up uh it sounds like rustling leaves pretty sure that's what it is because this doesn't look like it's flowing too fast but here is a cool little stream and this stream goes into the lake down there and it also connects um, one of the upper lakes but yeah so is this about the similar type of terrain you guys have over in the in your part of the UK? Yeah, definitely. It's just mainly forest, a lot of duff on the ground, fallen trees, a lot of vegetation. Um, it's really interesting though to see the different wild plants and wild flowers. Um, normally, sort of flowers that grow there would be, you know, the bluebells and all the different types of bells, um, which I, they're one of my favourite flowers um, at this time of year, um, but it's cool to see something similar in Vermont. So similar and different all at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> Sweet. Well, we're going to keep on moving, um, and hopefully it doesn't start raining on us. So let's go. So in this part of the United States, there's a lot of um, birch trees, and a fungus that likes to grow on the birch trees is called, oh, well, we call it a horse hoof fungus or horseshoe fungus or something around there. Um, but what it looks like is exactly that, like a horse's hoof. And um, the cool thing about this fungus is if you can manage to break it off, which this stuff is rotten away, so that's why you can break it off. Um, but you crack it open, there's like a orange substance inside, and you can dry that out or cure it, and that will um, make a fire starter. It's a really flammable substance, and we call it amadou. And Luther has told me, well, I've seen in his videos, about a similar type of um, fungus that he can turn into a fire starter. Yeah, we have in, in the UK a fungus known as coal fungus. It's got many names, so it's called coal fungus. Uh, there's a really funny one that I think is quite comedic. It's King Alfred's Cakes, and they're also called crumples. And they are, they look very similar to this horseshoe fungus, um, however they are balls. Um, so they grow on the sides of dead standing trees. So around here you can see many dead logs um, that have or well, dead trees that have fallen down and are now rotting logs um, but coal fungus wouldn't really grow on that they would grow on standing trees um, it has to be dry uh, if it's wet they won't grow um, but I think one of the maybe benefits of coal fungus or advantages over this one is that to get the actual fire starter from coal fungus you don't have to cure it just take it off the tree and you can use it straight away. I would personally have one that you don't really have to prepare ahead of time because that does take quite a while to get it um, in the mode where it can actually start a fire easily. But yeah, just a cool little um, bushcraft tip. So we're hiking along and haven't seen too much for wildlife. Uh, seen a few things here and there. So we thought we might as well savor every little bean, including slugs. Luther's here getting a picture of him right now. But there he is, just a quick little glimpse. Looks like a worm with ears. So we've come across another one of these um, balsam firs here. Uh, this one's much better because it's older, it's got larger pimples on it. And I'll just show you what I was talking about. So here's one. You just, if I can get through the bark. See there's a little hole and all this resin that comes out, super flammable. 
it makes a good fire starter. Which, as you can probably guess, if there's a forest fire, these guys light up like fireworks. So here's a birch tree. It looks like it's taking a seat on this rock. And there's a little den under here, I'm trying to figure out what lives in here. Notice a whole bunch of mosquitoes are flying out, so I'm guessing that's what lives in here. Because there is some stagnant water down there, so it's probably a good little area for mosquitoes to lay their eggs and have their larvae form into blood-sucking parasites. So the sound and the noise that Alec and I heard just earlier on, um, we thought it may have been the wind blowing through all these fir trees, um, but really it was quite a raging strong river, um, so that's cool to see. But did you see any fish in there, Alec? I have not seen any fish yet. Alec and I have almost finished our little hike uh, on the trail, um, but I just want to talk about this. Um, this is obviously a birch tree, white birch, and a lot of people may know, uh, if you're interested in bushcraft and survival, that um, the, the, the bark is super, super handy, because it can be used for so many things, um, primarily fire starting, um, because it peels off, as you can see on that tree, um, into sort of paper, paper thin um, pieces of bark. And it's super useful, it has a resin in it that is highly flammable and is super useful for fire starting. But over here we have a different type of birch. Um, I'm not quite sure um, what the species is, but I'm guessing, and so is Alec, that it is yellow birch. As you can see, this is a tiny bit different. Instead of being white as the white birch is, um, it's almost a golden browny yellow colour. Um, and the birch does the same thing. It has similar properties. As you can see, it peels off very easily, but you can distinguish it if you look at a white birch, obviously the colours, but also how this is all ribbony. This peels off into ribbons, and that peels off into big flakes. Um, so, yeah, super, super handy tip. Sometimes the white birch can look a bit yellow and you can't distinguish between the two, um, but they both have the same properties and they're both really useful in fire starting. So we've made the full loop now and we've um, gotten back to this stream you saw earlier. We were on the bridge. Uh, a lot of fish like to wait in the currents or um, just pass the currents because as the rivers flow down, they will drag all sorts of stuff with them, like bugs that fall in the water and um, little fish and little nymphs and whatnot. And um, more so on the other one because it's faster flowing, but you can um, see this one. So they'll be dragged down, then they'll be popped out right there and they're waiting there to hunt. So if you can throw a fly in or a lure or whatever, then you should be good to go. So hopefully we will have some luck with the fishing. <coughs> I think I ate a bug. We've got all sorts of <coughs> fish here. Typically the northern species, which are like uh, walleye and smallmouth bass, as well as northern pike. And if we're lucky, maybe some lake trout, or if some um, other trout, like brook trout, <coughs> happen to be in here as well from the river, then that's another plus. I have fished in the past when I was younger, around about nine years ago, so that was a very, very long time ago. Um, but I did love fishing. It was a, a super exciting and super fun uh, task to do. Um, but really, I haven't been fishing. Um, we haven't really had access to it. And I guess with my new diet, I've never thought that I needed to fish. Um, but yeah, in the past, I would fish rainbow trout. And we did a bit of sea fishing here and there. Um, and also, I loved um, trying to get out some crabs from the sea. Um, so yeah, seafood and fishing is something I did love to do. Um, I loved to do in the past. So this will be exciting to do it here. Well, what do you say? We test our luck. Sure. So typically whenever I go fishing, it's a lot of the time just for sport. You know, I don't tend to keep any of the fish that I catch. It's typically like 95% of the fish that I catch I will release. I mean, I like eating fish and all, but it's not very fun for me to have to kill a fish. It's, but if yeah. I were in a survival situation, you know, it's an option. Um, would you consider eating a fish if you were to catch a big enough one? Sure, yeah. Well, as you may know, my diet is being a vegan. Um, yeah. So that strictly prohibits me from eating 
any sort of product from an animal. Um, but the main reason I'm vegan isn't because of maybe the animal's sake, but really for the sake of the environment. And I know that fishing on a large scale is quite damaging to the environment. Yeah. Um, so there are huge ships going through the sea and just setting out nets and they rip up the seabed. And I don't want to support that. And that's really the only way I can get fish. Um, it's from the shop and they are fish um, from that from that way unless I bought it locally of course um, but catching it myself I feel like um, is much more sustainable I'm able to get the fish myself um, I'm not damaging the environment um, and yeah I'd totally eat a fish yeah. um, if I um, caught it myself and it was big enough to eat but yeah Luther has caught a fish, his first American fish, as you can see here. This is a type of sunfish. Not exactly sure what it is. It might be pumpkin seed, but I know we don't have these guys in Texas from what I've seen, but they're extremely colorful fish, as you can see. Did he put up a pretty good fight? Yeah. <laughs> so, that's awesome. Nice job. So we will get him unhooked. Um, unfortunately, he's not eating size, so he is going back and yeah, we'll try and see if we can't widen your species checklist and maybe catch some bigger fish. So nice job. Man, that's a really cool looking fish. There we go, nice and easy. Whoa. You good? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <Dang wrong. laughs> oh. I'll go back to it. <laughs> you know what? I hate boots. It's because I'm a freak man. I like barefoot shoes. Sorry about that, Luther. <laughs> about to head out. What fish is that, Alec? This is a smallmouth bass. Ah, okay, there we go. So their jaw, when it's closed, doesn't descend all the way behind their eye, which makes them smallmouth bass. This guy isn't too big, and you could eat him. You aren't going to get a whole lot of meat off of him. But yeah, that's a cool fish right there. So we just pulled out a new species from the lake, or pond, and this is a yellow perch. This is a northern species. You typically find these in the northern United States, and they're real cool. Um, they get much bigger. They are in the walleye family, but they got pretty red fins there and then stripes on the side. But we're going to pop them back into the water. Alright you guys, welcome back to another meal time. Uh, tonight Luther and I are going to be enjoying a cool little um, type of dinner. These are MREs. Um, no, it is not a MER. It's actually an acronym for Meal Ready to Eat. Everything inside this bag um, is going to give you the ability to make the meal. You don't really need anything from the outside. You don't need a fire, as we have going on right now. The only reason we have the fire on 
is uh, to heat up some water, boil up some water, so we can maybe enjoy a cup of tea, maybe hot chocolate later. But I'm pretty hungry, so what do you say? We get cooking. Oh yeah. Just Which like that. enough for me. Whoa. All right, as you can see in my MRE, there's a bunch of different bags in here. Um, here I have some crackers, some raisins and nuts. Um, and then right here I've got a cookie. <laughs> uh, and then I reckon this is the thing, um, the, the uh, contraption and all the chemicals that we'll be using to cook this. Uh, nutrition facts and side things. So it is, uh, it's a meal that will fill you up definitely. Um, it's got some jam, some uh, like condiments type stuff. I think yeah, a little gum in there for afterwards. This is the fried rice. Everything comes in its own separate little package. Turn off the bag and place pouch in bag with heater. All right, so I have filled this pouch um, with the heater and also with the food, the pouch that I want to heat up so that I can cook the food. And now the instructions are telling me to fill just a tiny bit of the pouch up with water and then a chemical reaction should take place where it heats up. That looks about right. Fold it over. Fold it over. Now we wait. It should be ready in about 10 to 15 minutes. So I've had to resort to putting my meal in um, a little metal container uh, because I made a little mistake when I put it on the rock to heat up. I put it up upside down and some of the water came out during the boiling process so um, it, it didn't heat up properly um, but I'm going to use the fire that we have already set up here to heat my food up. Alright you guys so we are doing some night fishing and here is a type of catfish called a bullhead. Now these guys um, tend to live in like muddy lakes and ditches and stuff, but you can find them in nicer lakes like this one. Um, this guy is a catfish, so he's got barbs and he's got, um, if you touch him, you'll get all slimy and smelly. So I'm gonna try and do it, try and unhook him without touching him too much. And he's got his whiskers and his sensory pores and he's got the hook in there quite a way, so I'm gonna grab my hook out, get him off, and then get him back in the water. early today so I could get outside do a bit of exploring I've already found some turtles there are some ducks that landed Whew, so many cobwebs about I'm walking all into them oh, and really just having a good time um, with the camera and out here in the forest but I want to talk about my opinion on camping or how to embrace it the most Whew, so many cobwebs we've talked about the food that you would eat and little activities that you can do whilst camping, like fishing and hiking and exploring. Um, but I think the most important aspect of camping and getting outside in the wilderness is getting out and exploring at dawn and dusk. So when it's early morning and when the sun is about to drop behind 
the horizon. You go out at dawn and dusk and you'll see so much more because all the wildlife, all the animals come out really at dawn and dusk. I just saw a whole bunch of turtles. They're really difficult to film because they can hear you really well and as soon as you step on a twig, boom, they're gone. Now obviously you can have lions and do what you want. Um, remember, camping is all about having fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. In my opinion, for me, getting up early is the best. Apart from all the insects, the spider webs. <laughs> There are so many bugs around the camera. Ugh, that's not the best thing. All right, before I get eaten alive by these flying insects, I better head back to camp, get Alec, and carry on with this awesome adventure. <laughs> that is distracting us from the natural beauty. There is a loon. He's caught one fish so far. Um, but we're almost drawing our canoe trip to a close. Yeah, it's really, really, really pretty. Up next on the list of things to do is to teach Alec a bit of boxing. I'm a boxer myself and I'm going to teach him the stance and everything around boxing um, so that we can have a bit of fun. A pair of gloves, these will be yours. I'll give you a hand with ten minutes. Thank you. That pair is my new pair of gloves and this is my old pair of gloves. Um, and this pair that you're wearing right there, um, that pair is quite special because that is a vegan pair of boxing gloves. Some people would think, how do you even get vegan boxing gloves? Um, but instead of using leather, uh, traditional leather, um, some boxing gloves use leather and some don't. I'm not quite sure about this one. But these ones definitely are not made of leather. And obviously leather's from a cow. And yeah, this is using synthetic material from plastics and recycled plastics hmm. and other things like that. Good and so know. that's a good good pair of gloves you got there. <laughs> so first you're going to stand normally and you'll put your front foot forward and your left foot back and tilt that one so it goes up. Oh, did I say left foot? I meant back foot. Yeah, uh, it's all good. Okay, right. You're going to bend your knees slightly and lean on the back, back knee so you're leaning back. And then um, when we're boxing always remember to lift the back heel up but for now you don't have to do that. And that just gives you a bit of movement. So if I stand like this and you push me then I'll fall over. If I stand like this and you push me, I don't fall over. To position your hands, bring your, your gloves, your hands right down low, so your elbows are touching just the top of your hips, then bring them up. Step forward, you're gonna move your 
front foot first and your back foot, and then to step back, back foot first, and then your front. So you can hit me there, and I take the tiniest step back, you can't hit me. So people will waste their energy trying to bounce about, trying to get out of the way, but all you have to do is take tiny little steps. So the first punch um, that we all need to know is the jab, and that is just putting out the left hand and stepping in at the same time, then bringing it back and stepping out. And that is the jab, using the left hand. Um, and you always have your elbows pointing down, never lift them up, and there's a big reason for that. And that is because <laughs> if I punch and I lift my elbow up, the opponent will see that my elbow is coming up and know I'm going to punch. If it comes down there, they won't be able to see it. Good. Step forward, and then step back. And then step back. Good. You would have done your jab, and that comes back. And then to do a right hand, it is twisting your body and then extending your arm out. Like that? Yeah, but it has to hit me, so it goes okay. in a straight line. So your feet will move, and your hips move. See my hips moving around? Yep. Yeah, um, we can go into a few defences. So obviously, um, boxing isn't just about hitting the other person, it's about not getting hit. There are sort of two types of defences. There are sort of the active ones where you're hitting them back, um, taking the shots with your, with your gloves, and then there are ones that all you have to do is move out of the way so that they can't hit you. And the parry is where they will throw a jab, so if you can throw a jab at me nice and slow, and you block it out of the way. It's a very, very useful defense. Good. I think we should get into maybe a little boxing bout. Sounds good. Okay, you guys, freaking out right now because I just took up a coin that says 1833. And if that's a real coin, that's gonna be by far the oldest coin I have ever found. It says United States of America on the back. You wanna be careful if it is silver. It came out looking like this, so I'm guessing it is silver because you can actually um, rub away the detail because it's such a soft metal. But yeah, you guys, that's awesome. <laughs> the past, I don't know, 20 minutes or so digging out what I thought originally was a street sign because I could only see this little green corner. But as I wiggled it around and dug more, I learned that this is a New Hampshire license plate. An H, there's the car number and all that, 1914. And on the back, it's got a little stamp there. But this is definitely one of the weirdest things and most difficult things that I've ever dug up. And now I just need the car and I'll be good to go.
So this adventure is winding down, but I have had a blast for sure. Yeah, definitely I have. And it's been amazing. We got to do some fishing. You've caught um, your first fish in a long time. Yeah, I caught a pumpkin seed, a perch, and was it smallmouth bass? Yep, yeah. Yeah, that you was super You got quite awesome. the species list. I <laughs> uh, got to do some fire starting. We yeah. also got to do a bit of metal detecting, and I found my first capped bust half dime, which was pretty cool. That's from quite that a while ago. Crazy. I think my favorite bit was probably the hiking with Alec and also just the, the random wildlife encounters. Uh, just here at our camp, we came across so many animals um, like loons and one time uh, some, a duck and her ducklings came swimming right up to me. Um, and that was really, really awesome. So yeah, just seeing the, the different wildlife here has been incredible. And another thing is I got to try boxing for the first time, which was a lot of fun. Luther yeah. taught me that. And through the whole adventure, I have gotten to wear a new pair of shoes, my own pair of freets. It's been a blast all around, and I want to thank you for coming over to um, our side of the pond and enjoying what America has to offer. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me, Alec. And you guys may have noticed our beautiful American flag hanging up here in the backdrop, our whole time camping here and Luther I wanted to give this to you as a souvenir to take back to the UK. Thank you Alec that is really awesome. Always remember to stay happy, stay humble and most of all stay wild! Oh sorry. <coughs> it's fine. <laughs> I do that again. <laughs>